Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today, today I'm joined by Dr. Oded Galor. He is Herbert H. Goldberger, Professor of Economics at Brown University. And today we're going to focus our interview on his book, The Journey of Humanity, The Origins of Wealth and Inequality. And we're going to focus mostly on the two main mysteries that Dr. Galor uh, explores there, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality. So Dr. Galor, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's wonderful to be on your show. Thank you. So let's start by tackling the mystery of growth then. So uh, as an economist, what is the mystery of growth exactly? So broadly speaking, my, uh, my book, The Journey of Humanity, explores the evolution of human societies since the emergence of modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And this exploration surrounds two fundamental mysteries that are associated with this journey. As you said, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality. The mystery of growth is basically an attempt to understand why is it the case that over most of human existence, over 99.9% .9 of human existence, societies are in a state of stagnation. And then in the past 200 years, we see this remarkable transformation in living standards. Income per capita in the world as a whole has increased 14 fold. Life expectancy has more than doubled and an incredible divergence occurred in the world economy in the past 200 years. So again, the question is, why is it the case that over 99.9% .9 of human existence, societies are in a state of stagnation? And what are the forces that ultimately permitted the transition from stagnation to growth? Related to this is the second mystery, which is the mystery of inequality. Namely, what is the origin of the vast inequality in the wealth of nations? Why some countries are rich and others are poor? And why do we see this incredible divergence in the wealth of nations in the past 200 years? And so, uh, I mean, related to growth uh, in the book, you go through several uh, major steps in our evolutionary history. And one of them includes the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa. So uh, how did it occur and why do you think it's important as a step in trying to get at the point where growth really takes off? Right. So... Part of the argument that I raise in my book, The Journey of Humanity, is that a significant portion of the inequality that we see across the globe today can be traced to forces that operated in the distant past. Namely, much of the inequality that we see across the globe today is originated in forces that were formed hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago. And therefore, if we would like to have a better understanding of the growth process, we would like to have a better understanding of the inequality as we see it across the globe today, we have to place ourselves in the distant past and understand the forces that operated in the distant past and their importance for the understanding of inequality. So as I said, humanity emerged in Africa 300,000 years ago. Homo sapiens is emerging around this time period. Now, at the time when humanity is emerging, the size of the human population is relatively small. But nevertheless, unlike other species, humanity is equipped with a very powerful tool, which is the human brain. And the human brain is allowing humanity to shape the environment in which people are operating via technological progress. So the size of the human population is very small initially, but nevertheless, people are innovating. 
And this expansion in resources permit more people to be supported. Child mortality declines, fertility increases, and gradually as resources are expanding, the size of the human population is expanding as well. And as we have more people, we have more potential innovators, and this affects, again, technological progress. So over a long period of time in Africa, we see that humans are becoming more skilled, better hunters, and as a result of it, they're able to shape the environment in which they operate, and they're able to support significantly larger population. At a certain point, the size of the human population in Africa exceeds the caring capacity of the African continent, and humans are starting to explore the possibility of living elsewhere. And we see the gradual dispersion of modern human from Africa as early as 200,000 years ago, but a more significant wave is occurring around 60,000 years ago. As people are migrating out of Africa, initially they move into virgin ecological niches. They go into these niches, they're able to hunt, they're able to gather, and as a result of it, despite the fact that the human population is expanding, the standard of living of this population is not declining because any expansion is causing simply people to move into new, unexplored ecological niches. But this process lasts still about the eve of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. Namely, we reach a stage in which humanity is in fact covering virtually all possible ecological niches, and consequently further expansion of the human population is no longer feasible given the limited resources. And this forces humanity to innovate, namely in order to sustain this expanding population. Humanity is moving into agriculture, namely humanity is discovering the, the cycle of nature, humanity starts to domesticate plants, domesticate animals, and ultimately uh, um, move into sedentary agricultural communities as opposed to hunter and gatherers. And this process is basically allowing the size of the human population to expand even more significantly before, than before, because on average, one acre of land that is occupied by farmers can support 100 times more people than the same acre of land that is occupied by hunter and gatherers. So this transition into the Neolithic Revolution is generating an incredible boom in the context of the size of the human population. And importantly, if this transition to agriculture would not have taken place, humanity would be on the verge of a major catastrophe in the sense that, again, ecological niches were occupied, people could not support the size of the human population, and it was the necessity that caused people to discover agriculture, to move into agricultural communities, and to support this expanding human population. And does that connect in any way to the Malthusian thesis? And if so, in what conditions does it apply? Right. So it is intimately related to the Malthusian thesis. So in fact, over most of human existence, over 99.9% .9 of human existence, societies are in what we define a Malthusian epoch or a Malthusian trap. What does it mean? This is a time period in which technological progress is taking place. It is not as rapid as it is today, but technological progress is taking place. But unlike today's world, in which technological progress is converted into human prosperity, at that time, technological prosperity was converted into more sizable population. If you look at variations in the level of technology across the globe, what you will find is that societies that are more advanced technologically, a very similar level of income per capita to those that are less advanced technologically, 
But on the other hand, they have significantly larger populations. So what we see over this time period is that when technology arrives, and as a result of it, resources are expanding, mortality rate declines, fertility rate increases, and the size of the human population adjusts in such a way that income per capita or resources per capita are reverting back to the previous equilibrium position. And consequently, over this time period, we see fluctuation in the standard of living around the subsistence level. When technology arrives, income per capita increases temporarily, but population adjusts and income per capita reverts back to the previous equilibrium position. So as I said, quite strikingly, over this 99.9% .9 of human existence, we do not see any significant improvement in living standard. Then suddenly, as I said before, in the past 200 years, we see this dramatic metamorphosis in living standard, a 14-fold increase in income per capita in the past 200 years after 300,000 years of near stagnation. And as I said before, this is the mystery of growth, the mystery that is resolved in the context of the theory that I advanced that is known as unified growth theory and a mystery that is explored in the first part of the book that I just released, The Journey of Humanity. Yes, and we will get into the industrial revolution and all that, that derived from it and also into more specifically your unified growth theory. But before that, let me just ask you two more questions. So uh, at a certain point, you touched on uh, the introduction of agriculture there. So do, you, do we know what factors really led to the development of agriculture? And can we say, or can we tell why people adopted agriculture and started uh, settlements and all of that. Okay, so there are different views about the, the forces or the dominating forces that led into agriculture. Yes. I'm a proponent of the demographic view. Namely, as I said before, the size of the human population expanded gradually in the course of human history. And in the eve of the agricultural revolution, the size of the human population was such that, in fact, resources per person were on the verge of declining below subsistence. Namely, humanity was on the verge of extinction. And as a result of it, humanity realized that there is a need to be innovative, to find different ways of supporting, uh, supporting individuals, and this led into the observation of certain cycles that existed in nature, the observation that led into the domestication of plants and ultimately domestica the domestication of animals and the transition into sedentary agricultural communities. Now, this could not happen in the abstract. Naturally, this was happening in conjunction with certain climatic changes that occurred at the time. So the end of the Ice Age, 11,700 years ago, was very important in this dimension because it allowed more of the land of the planet Earth to be cultivated, and this was an important element. And there are other climatic issues that were conducive to the transition to agriculture. But I'm a proponent of the view that what ultimately triggered the transition to agriculture is this enormous expansion of the human population that required a change in the mode of production. So some people, for instance, some anthropologists view the transition to agriculture as the worst mistake in human history. And this is in fact based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the process that occurred over this time period. But when they think about this worst mistake of human history, they look at the record and they look at the skeletal remain and they see that, in fact, hunter and gatherers had life expectancy that was higher than life expectancy of agriculturalists immediately after the Neolithic Revolution. They see that they suffer from less infectious diseases. Their work effort was, was uh, smaller, etc. 
So the question is, why do we see that humanity is transitioning into agriculture? And the argument is very simple. The record that we have is from a few thousand years before the Neolithic Revolution and the years after the Neolithic Revolution. If we would have continuous record, what we would see that in the transition towards the Neolithic Revolution, towards agriculture, there is a gradual decline in income per capita due to the fact that the size of the human population is expanding and there are no more free ecological niches to explore. And as a result of it, if you would like to hunt and you would like to gather, you have to bang into a nearby hunter-gatherer group. This generates conflicts and this gen generates limited resources. And at a certain point, resources per person are really reaching the minimal level that can support humans. And this is the time in which a transition is taking place and consequently, although we see a gradual decline in the standard of living relative to what existed thousands of years earlier, in fact, the generation that is making the transition is as well off as agriculturalists, as hunter-gatherers, and ultimately, it this generation is, is becoming slightly better off over time, particularly in the uh, ability of these generations to support larger populations. And with all of that in mind, do you think it we could call the development of agriculture an inevitability? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that the, the development of agriculture to a large extent was inevitable. In the absence of this development, we would see a, a humanity either reaching a, a plateau in terms of population and basically being in a standing still. But in fact, given the fact that humans are innovating, given the fact that technological progress is taking place, and as a result of it, more and more humans can be supported, as I said, in the absence of the discovery of agriculture, humans would be on the brink of partial extinction. And as a result of it, the agricultural revolution was an inevitable byproduct of the process of development, yes. So uh, you've already talked a bit about demographics there, and we're also going to talk about the effects that the Industrial Revolution had on demographics. But throughout most of human history, up till the past 200 years or so, what were the main factors that impacted human demographics? Right. So the, demo the human demographic was, was affected predominantly by technological progress. It is basically the resources that were available to humanity that governed the size of the human population. And initially, during the Malthusian epoch, as I said before, technological progress was converted into larger people rather than more prosperous people. So over 99.9% .9 of human existence, it is technological progress that is determining the size of the population. Technological progress and population growth are increasing proportionately over this time period. And as a result of it, in the long run, there is no change in the standard of living. But importantly, during this period of stagnation, in fact, there are certain Certain, there is certain dynamism that is present in the environment in which people are operating. First, as we said, technology is evolving. Second, the size of the human population is, uh, is increasing. But in addition, we see the adaptation of the human population to the technological environment. So there is a gradual adaptation, partly biological, partly cultural, and this adaptation reinforce the ability of people to innovate and to shape the environment in which they operate. So in the journey of humanity, I try to identify what I defined as the wheels of change that govern the journey of humanity over the entire course of human history. And the wheels of change that I identify are these three critical forces, technological progress, population growth, and human adaptation. And they are reinforcing one another. As I said earlier, humanity starts in Africa 300,000 years ago. 
the size of the human population is relatively limited. But this size, this population is able to shape the environment in which they operate. They advance technology. Advancement in technology support more people and in addition triggers human adaptation. And human adaptation and greater population supports further technological progress. And as a result of it, in the course of human history, we see these wheels of change rotating at an ever increasing pace. But nevertheless, over 99% of human existence, despite the rotation of the wheels of change, there is no change in the standard of living. And then we reach a critical point in which, as I said before, we see suddenly this major metamorphosis in the standard of living, a phase transition that suddenly permits humanity to break out from the Malthusian trap and to move into a, a new era, the era of sustained economic. So before we get into the Industrial Revolution itself, perhaps this would be a good point to introduce your unified growth theory. So what is it about and I mean, what perspective does it bring to the table when it comes to understanding uh, growth? So unified growth theory, unlike other theories of economic growth, is an attempt to understand the growth process in its entirety rather than to focus on the modern growth regime or the Malthusian regime or the post-Malthusian regime. It's a theory that is consistent with the evolution of human societies over the entire course of human history. Now, why is it so important? It is important because empirical evidence are showing us unambiguously that much of the inequality as we see across the globe today is originated in forces that operated in a distant past. And as a result of it, in order to shed light on the inequality that we see at the moment, we have to understand how economic development occurred over the entire course of human history and how it led into the takeoff from stagnation to growth in general and the differential timing of the takeoff from stagnation to growth across the globe. Because those societies that managed to move into uh, sustained economic growth earlier than others magnified their standard of living relative to the rest of the world and generated much of the inequality that occurred in, uh, in the past two, uh, 200 years. So as I said, unified growth theory is a theory that is designed to capture the process of development as a whole so as to have a better understanding of the roots of inequality today and the roots of economic growth uh, today. Mm -hmm. And as part of it, unified growth theory, as I said, identifies the fundamental forces that governs the journey of humanity over the entire course of human history. These wheels of change that I just underlined, namely technological progress, the size of the human population, and the adaptation of the human population. So this perhaps takes us into the roots of the takeoff. So if we would like to understand why the takeoff is taking place and why is it related, if you wish, to the Industrial Revolution, the idea is very simple. So the idea, as I said, is that we see these three wheels of change that are operating in the course of human history. They're reinforcing one another. As the technological progress, more people are supported. More people, more potential innovators, faster technological progress. Faster technological progress, greater human adaptation. Greater human adaptation, more technological progress. So the wheels of change are rotating in the course of human history. And as a result of it, we are moving from stone tool technologies to steam engine technologies in the eve of the Industrial Revolution. It appears that there is no change on the surface. Income per capita is hardly changing over this time period, but technological progress is increasing exponentially, and we reach a critical point in which the technological environment changes so rapidly so that in order to navigate this rapidly changing technological environment, in order to be able to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment, human capital or education is needed. And as a result of it, parents start to be engaged in educating their children. But education is costly. 
parents are too poor, their income per capita is very close to the subsistence. They have a limited budget, and as a result of it, they had to economize on another item in their budget constraint, namely the number of children. So they invest more in the education of each child, but this comes on the account of the number of children. So we reach a critical point in which the rate of technological progress becomes so high so as to trigger investment in human capital. This investment in human capital triggers fertility decline, setting in motion the so-called demographic transition, the dramatic decline in fertility that frees the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population. So what permits this dramatic transformation in living standard is precisely the impact of technological progress on, uh, on population growth. Over most of human history, technological progress is converted into increasingly in increasing number of people. But due to the acceleration in technological progress and the need for human capital in order to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment, education increases, fertility starts to decline, and consequently, for the first time in human history, technological progress is no longer counterbalanced by population growth, and technological progress is converted into the well-being of the population rather than the size of the human population. So about the Industrial Revolution, one of the big questions out there that economists have tried to tackle over the years is to try to understand uh, how and why it occurred and why specifically it started in England and not, for example, in places like China or the Middle East. So do you have uh, an explanation for that? Right, so, so I want to initially to make a very important clarification here. Okay. According to unified growth theory, what brought about the transition from stagnation to growth is not the industrial revolution, but the increase in the pace of technological progress. As I said before, inevitably, the rate of technological progress reached a critical point beyond which a phase transition occurred Fertility started to decline, and the growth process was free from the counterbalancing effect of the population. Now, this rapid technological progress was manifested partly in industrial technology. But industrialization per se is not really key to the understanding of the transition from stagnation to growth. It is the pace of technological progress that brought about the change. Industrialization per se is not very important. In fact, as I argued in the book and elsewhere, if you think about regions of the world today that were industri that industrialized first, think about, say, uh, the United States and the Rust Belt, where the Industrial Revolution first took, took place, or where industrial zones these are the regions that are today are lagging behind because industrial technology is not very conducive for human capital formation, for education, and ultimately for technological innovations. The same is true in France, the same is true in Germany, and the same is true in England. So it's really not about industrialization, it is about the pace of technological progress. But nevertheless, the Industrial Revolution is an important phenomenon, and the question is, what can be stated about, uh, about the Industrial Revolution? So why the Industrial Revolution occurred in England rather than in France or in Germany or in Holland, that's sort of, it's an interesting question, but I don't think that it's very important for the understanding of the march of humanity. What is really important in this respect is to understand why the Industrial Revolution, why industrialization, occurs much earlier in Europe than in China. Then it's really not fine details because naturally why a small country like England is basically taking off first rather than, than Holland or France or Germany could be just a random event that is leading this to, to take place. But why Europe rather than China is very important. But when we think about the relationship between Europe and China, 
clearly in the Middle Ages, China is dominating technologically and Europe is lagging behind. And why is it so? Well, part of it has to do with the fact that the Chinese society is very cohesive culturally and socially. This is partly based on the geographical endowment of China, geographical connectivity that permits political unification and prevents political competition and generates an entity that is very cohesive and produces very effectively within a technological regime. In contrast, Europe is geographically fragmented. It is much more diverse and consequently it is engage in political competition that in the short run are not very conducive for development, but in time of transition, they're very important. So in the agricultural stage of development, China is dominating because of social cohesiveness. But in the transition from agriculture to industry, it is Europe that has the upper hand because Europe has the cultural fluidity. So it's to adopt new cultural paradigms, new technological paradigms, new scientific paradigms, and ultimately new technological paradigms. And China is too rigid to be able to make this move and it remains behind. So why Europe rather than China? As I said, it has to do with cultural fluidity in Europe versus cultural homogeneity in China. Cultural homogeneity is very uh, uh, is very important in the short run because it is conducive for social cohesiveness and, uh, and greater productivity within a technological paradigm, but it's a great liability in the transition from one paradigm to another. So it's not an accident that the Enlightenment is adopted in Europe rather than in China. Again, it requires a certain amount of cultural fluidity that was present in Europe. It is not an accident. The scientific revolution is taking place in Europe rather than in China. Again, it requires certain cultural and certain uh, cultural fluidity that is present in Europe. And as a result of it, it's not an accident that the industrial revolution is occurring in uh, Europe rather than in China. But as I said, why England rather than, than Holland or Germany or France, these are minor details in my viewpoint because they do not really shed light on the evolution of humanity as a whole. It could be a random event, perhaps the glorious revolution that is taking place in, in, uh, in, 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 um, in England uh, rather than in other places, but random events that could have uh, triggered the, the dominance of England over, uh, over other countries within the European continents. But I find it much less exciting, less, much less important for the understanding of the journey of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned there the importance of cultural fluidity and the uh, beneficial effects on innovation, for example, but also uh, some effects when it comes to the social cohesiveness, namely it drops a little bit. Do you think that we should worry too much about lower social cohesiveness? Uh, I mean, when comparing to perhaps the benefits we get from more diversity, more innovation, and so on. Right. So when we think about the relationship between diversity and economic development, diversity have conflicting effects on productivity. On the one hand, more diverse societies benefit from cross-fertilization of ideas, cross-pollination, complementarities in the production process, and, and as a result of it, greater innovations in productivity. But on the other hand, more diverse societies tend to suffer from social non-cohesiveness. Diverse societies tend to be more uh, mistrustful, Diverse societies tend to disagree about the desirable public goods, and diverse societies tend to have more so civil conflicts. And as a result of it, at any point in time, there are two forces that are operating, a beneficial force on innovations and an adverse force on social cohesiveness. And consequently, there is a sweet spot level of diversity that is conducive to innovations. Namely, a level of diversity, an intermediate level of diversity that on the one hand is sufficiently conducive for innovations, but on the other hand, 
is sufficiently respective of the importance of social cohesiveness. But if you look at the journey of humanity, and if you think about the, the evolution of human societies in the course of human history, what was very important in the past is not necessarily what is important today in terms of diversity. But if you think about the level of diversity that was conducive for development, say in the year 1500, in the Middle Ages, this was the level of diversity that was prevalent in China, in Korea, in Japan, societies that we do not view as optimally diverse. But this was a different time period. Societies lived within the agricultural paradigm. Technological progress was not very rapid. And social cohesiveness, as we, as we discussed earlier, was much more important than innovativeness. And these societies had the upper hand. But as we move into today's world, and the technological environment becomes more and more demanding, cultural fluidity and the ability to adapt to a rapidly changing technological environment becomes much more important. And as a result of this sweet spot level of diversity shifting in such a way that societies like the US society are appeared to have the optimal level of diversity. Namely, they're sufficiently diverse to benefit from innovations and, and, uh, and uh, a cultural fluidity. But at the same time, they are uh, um, they maintain certain level of social cohesiveness that allows them to, uh, to function. So again, the importance of social cohesiveness is declining over time. The importance of diversity is increasing over time. It doesn't imply necessarily that we can move into an extreme in which social cohesiveness is entirely absent. But the intermediate level of diversity is gradually shifting in favor of societies that are increasingly more diverse. And we saw it, as I said before, even in the course of industrialization. The reason that Europe is taking off first is that Europe is culturally fluid and is ready to make the adaptation, whereas China is too rigid uh, uh, culturally to make the change. Mm -hmm. So, and what changes were behind the demographic transition over these past 200 years? Because, of course, across the globe, on a global scale, we've seen a huge increase, uh, putting it, uh, looking at it from an historical perspective, of course, a huge increase in the human population going from I guess one point something billion in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, and now we are at this point past eight billion. So, uh, what were the changes that led to that? Right. So there are two factors that were important in what we see in the context of the current demographic patterns. So yeah. the transition from stagnation to growth started to take place. Resources expanded very dramatically, and they could support an increasing population and led into this incredible boom in the size of the human population. But as I, as I said, sooner or later, the rate of technological progress became so rapid, so as to induce investment in education. Investment in education came on the account of fertility, and fertility rates started to decline. But this process did not occur at the same time period across the globe. Western European societies experienced the demographic transition towards the end of the 19th century, whereas other regions of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, only very recently. And consequently, an incredible divergence took place in the world economy. Those societies that moved into an early demographic transition generated an incredible increase in income per capita. As I said, on average, 14-fold increase. Those societies that remain behind were trapped more or less at the same level of income per capita, and consequently, an incredible divergence occurred in income per capita across the globe. So the main trigger of the demographic transition is the acceleration in the rate of technological progress and its impact on human capital formation. Okay. But naturally, as I said, it occurred, I mean, 
logical acceleration and the demand for education occurred in very t- different time periods across the globe, leading into much of the inequality as we see across the globe today. Mm-hmm. And just to put things into perspective, what are some of the biggest, the most significant social improvements that occurred over the past 200 years across the globe, more or less? Right. So, so when I talk about this metamorphosis in the, in, in the standard of living, so we talked about 14-fold increase in income per capita in the past 200 years. We refer to, as I said, life expectancy that more than doubled in the past uh, in the past two hundred years. These are manifestations of certain changes that occurred uh, over this time period. So we see technology accelerate technological progress accelerates, fertility rate starts to decline. And ultimately, we see certain transformations. So we see the movement from agriculture to industry. We see changes in political systems. We see a gradual process of democratization, civil liberties, and uh, and that this naturally reinforces the growth process and permits the growth process to be more sustainable because the growth process becomes more inclusive. It permits social mobility. It permits uh, uh, it permits a better allocation of uh, of talents across occupations. Uh, when it comes to, before we move on to inequality, when it comes to demographics, uh, there are people nowadays that worry a little bit about the trends in declining fertility rates across the globe and particularly more so in the most developed countries. Do, do you think uh, we should be worried about that? Or, and do you think that we can avert the catastrophic demographic outcomes that we've seen uh, in our past history? Right. So uh, I'm not uh, in agreement with many of uh, the observers that view the, the current decline in fertility rates as uh, as a potential uh, detrim- as having potentially detrimental effect on the growth process. The way that I think about it is very different. Yes, fertility rates are declining. Yes, uh, if we think about total fertility rates in, say, Western European countries and in many other countries across the globe, they're well below replacement at the moment. So if this current trend will continue, we will see an actual decline in the size of the human population. Now, is this necessarily uh, an issue? And in my mind, it is not an issue because what really matters, I mean, so people are concerned about the dependency ratio. They're concerned about the fact that the size of the of the older population, the population outside of the labor force, relative to the size of the population that is in the labor force, is increasing over time. The dependency ratio increases, and perhaps this is not sustainable. But the way that I view it is very different. It is still in the context of what I emphasized before, which is related to what is called the quantity quality trade-off. Namely, at the moment that fertility is declining, in fact, parents have more resources to invest in the education of the few children that they do have. And consequently, the productivity, it's true that the, the working age population in size will be smaller, but if we adjust the size to quality, the quality of this generation is significantly higher and consequently the productivity of this generation can more than compensate for uh, the increase in the size of the older population. Now there is one limitation which is naturally if there is a demand for certain services that are required by the elderly this requires massive amount of people and this, this cannot be supported by people that have higher education or higher quality. But again, technology will be be at hand to assist the the elderly. And consequently, I do not necessarily see a clash in this. In fact, growth theory in general suggests to us that if fertility rates decline, 
income per capita can increase in the, in the long run. Now, the question here is just the transition. We are in a process in which fertility rates is declining. And in this transition, we see changes, temporary changes in the dependency ratio. It could lead potentially into difficulties, but I do not envision it. As I said, I do think that ultimately technological progress will not be affected adversely because the quality of the population will be significantly higher. And I don't think that the productivity of nations will be uh, will be uh, will be affected adversely as long as the younger generation, as I anticipate, will become increasingly more productive. And we can think about it even in the context of AI technologies. I mean, the naturally, AI technologies will free us from a lot of the mundane tasks that we were engaged in before. And this implies that our time will be free for other type of uh, elements and consequently the dependency ratio will become even less important than before. So overall, I think that the decline in fertility is, for, is in fact uh, fantastic news to the world, certainly in the context of environmental degradation and climate change. Naturally, we are polluting planet Earth and if we have fewer of us on planet Earth, we are more likely to survive on planet Earth and we are more likely to preserve the environment. So this is one important element. But the second important element is that we know that fertility decline is key for economic prosperity. And in this respect, without entering into the philosophical issues of, uh, of uh, uh, what are the rights of the unborn, if we simply think about the individuals that are prevalent in society at the moment, it is uh, the case that we can live better and we can preserve the environment if fertility rates will continue to decline. So at the very beginning of the interview, I mentioned both mysteries, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, and you related one to the other. But uh, what are we trying to tackle exactly when we talk about the mystery of inequality? I mean, what is mysterious about it? So the mystery of inequality is what is what what are the roots of this vast inequality in the world of nations? Why some countries are so rich and others are poor, so poor? And why do we see this incredible divergence that occurred in the past 200 years? If you observe the world at the beginning of the 19th century, in the year 1800, the richest region of the world is about three times richer than the poorest one. If you observe the world today, the richest region of the world is about is 20 times richer, could be even 100 times richer depending how you define rich, richness. So what is the source of this incredible divergence that occurred in, in the wealth of nations. And so this is what I try to understand. And the way that I resolve the mystery, so once we understand the resolution of the mystery of growth, and we understand it at a certain point, inevitably, a takeoff will take place from stagnation to growth, and inevitably, because as I said, the wheels of change are rotating, and sooner or, not, sooner or later, the rate of technological progress reaches a critical point in which Unless you educate yourself, you cannot really comprehend the new technology. A demographic transition is taking place and the world is sailing into the modern growth regime. But what we see is that when the takeoff is taking place, say at the beginning of the 19th century, it occurs in some places across the globe and not in others. Western European countries and the offshoots in North America are taking off first. Others are lagging behind for a prolonged period of time. And since this takeoff is associated with a 14-fold increase in income per capita on average, a huge divergence is occurring across the globe. But if we think about inequality today, much of it is originated due to the differential timing of the takeoff from stagnation to growth that occurred in the past 200 years. And therefore, the second part of the book, The Journey of Humanity, attempts to understand why is it the case that some societies were able to take off much earlier than others. And this leads me into forces such as institutions, 
culture, geography, and human diversity that led into this differential takeoff, namely forces that allowed some societies to be prepared for, uh, for um, investment in human capital, a decline in fertility, adoption of advanced technologies, and other societies uh, to be uh, less prepared and consequently delaying their transition for, as I said, as much as 200 years. And so what would be the main factors that you identified there as playing a role in explaining these inequality across the societies? Right. So, so when your uh, viewers will, will read the book, they will realize that the book is divided into two parts. The first part is dealing with the mystery of growth. It's basically marching forward in time. I start in Africa 300,000 years ago, and I move all the way to the present, resolving the history of growth. The second part of the book is in fact starting at the present and reversing the axis of time, saying given the inequality that we see today, how can we understand it in light of forces that operated in the distant past? And I move gradually from the present all the way back to Africa in an attempt to understand these differences. Mm -hmm. And what I discover is that, that colonialism is important, but naturally colonialism is already based on uneven development. So we cannot stop. I mean, so colonialism expedited the transition of the colonial, uh, of the colonial forces from stagnation to growth and delayed the transition of, uh, of colonies in the sense that it's basically forced colonies to specialize in the production of raw material, agricultural goods that have limited demand for human capital, limited technological externalities. And as a result of it, the wheels of change in these societies, rather than rotating in, in a reasonable pace, started to slow down because there was lower and lower demand for education, lower and lower demand for, uh, uh, for human capital, and this delayed their transition. On the other hand, it expedited the transition of the most advanced societies. So colonialism is part of the explanation why do we see part of the divergence? But as I said, when you think about colonialism, colonialism is not the origin of the process because colonialism was already predicated on uneven development before. This basically allowed us to understand why some societies were colonizing others rather than vice versa. So then I, I explore the role of institutions. And I said, and, and I conclude that institutions are, are very, very important for the understanding of economic development. You look at growth enhancing, inclusive institutions versus growth retarding, um, extractive institutions, they cause some divergence. But they're not the primitive forces either because they are predicated on earlier development. So if you move into the agricultural revolution, you build cities, states, nations, empires, this natu naturally generates demand for institutions that will coordinate the actions of individuals, will protect property rights, and consequently, institutions are a byproduct of the process of development. Or if you think about say, land quality or soil suitability for large plantations that is prevalent in, in Mesoamerica. Soil quality that is, that is conducive for large plantation led into the emergence of large group of landowners that basically led into political concentration and ultimately into the implementation of extractive institutions and even slavery. And consequently, again, we can map geographical endowment to certain type of institutions. What I mentioned before, think about geographical connectivity that is prevalent in China. This led into low political competition and autocracy in the long run, and greater political competition and geographic fragmentation in Europe that led into, uh, into uh, democratic institutions in Europe. So again, it is geography that is ultimately feeding that into differential institutions that are emerging across the globe. The same is true in, in the context of culture. Culture is very important. 
There are certain cultural traits that are growth enhancing. There are other cultural traits that are growth retarding. And again, these cultural traits are emerging differentially across the globe based on geography. So what I conclude ultimately is that the two ultimate forces behind the inequality that we see across the globe today are first, geographical endowments and their impact on institutions and culture. And second, human diversity, as we mentioned before, that was basically determined due to the, uh, during the exodus of humans from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago. This exodus led into the compression of, uh, of population diversity with greater migratory distance from Africa. And consequently, the distribution of population diversity across the globe was affected by these migratory patterns and affected economic development uh, till uh, today's world. And, to, and so those are the factors or the causes behind different levels of inequality looking across different societies. But what would be the consequences? What are the consequences of that inequality? Well, so the consequences are predominantly significant inequality, significant divergence that we saw in the past 200 years, and the inability of societies to basically adopt proper technologies, proper education methods, and, and a proper accumulation of, uh, of physical capital. So these are the forces, the deep-rooted fo forces that are preventing convergence across society. If you think about sort of a conventional theory of economic growth, this theory would suggest that over time, countries will converge to one another and the initial conditions will dissipate over time. Unified growth theory in contrast suggests that initial conditions are very important and are very persistent. And as a result of it, you may see great amount of divergence for a prolonged period of time before you will see any convergence. So it is important to understand these forces because it will allow us to design policies that can mitigate inequality across the globe and policies that can expedite the transition of developing countries from stagnation to growth. And so, and this will be my last question then. Uh, so according to unified growth theory, should we expect or can we predict that in the future there would be uh, convergence and less inequality across countries? Right. So the unified growth theory suggests that societies will be unified in their poverty during the Malthusian epoch, uh, and the differences will be reflected in population density. During the takeoff, one should expect an incredible divergence, but over time, it will be the case that countries that are lagging behind will adopt the proper institutions, the, pol the proper cultural norms that are growth enhancing, and in addition, Technologies such as information technology, uh, information technology, transportation technologies, medical technologies that will mitigate the adverse effect of geography on, uh, on the uh, health environment, the adverse effect of technology on geographical isolation, etc. With all these forces in hand, over time, unified growth theory suggests that once we understand the importance of the past, we will be able to design policies that will generate a, a greater equality across the globe. So the prediction is greater equality over time in a very slow pace, but with the understanding of the forces, we will be able to design policies that are country specific, history specific, that will ultimately uh, mitigate inequality even further uh, than otherwise. Great. So uh, the book is, again, The Journey of Humanity, The Origins of Wealth and Inequality. Uh, Dr. Galor, uh, just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yes, so um, so 
anyone can can google my name and uh, i have a website that describes um, much of my work in addition you can i urge you to consider reading the journey of humanity in fact uh, the book was released in 31 different languages across the globe in, including uh, portuguese you can read it in the, the language of your choice it's it's written in a way that it is in fact the jargon free it's very readable and it's designed for uh, for the general public it is uh, supposed to be uh, written in a way that as i said will be accessible to any individual that is educated even a high school student will be able to enjoy a much of the insights Okay, great. So I'm leaving a, a link to the book and also to the rest of your work in the description box of this interview. And Dr. Galor, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. I really loved the book and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Good luck. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alec, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbur Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Ruinacio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Duns, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Librand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tam Amal, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desarauzo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevsky, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pans Cortez, Usla Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dealey Jr., Holt Erickbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassis, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.